Live from the House of LeMay Makeup and Dressing Room. Here comes Amber. Stop what you're doing. Here comes Amber. She's just doing what she can. Here comes Amber. Cue the spotlight. Here comes Amber with two drinks in her hand. The matriarch of fashion, sequence in her glasses, you can't look away. Ask her, does she do it? There's really nothing to it. She's got that fun on her game. If you have a party, or if you're feeling naughty, call up the house of the maid. Here comes your favorite gal. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn off all cell phones and get ready for your host, Amber LeMay. Hello, 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 and a glorious Memorial Day weekend to you all. Summertime, and it's here. All right, but first, I want you to like, share, subscribe. Come on, come on, doing it, doing it, doing it. There you go. Thank you so much. Now, we've got such a packed show tonight. We're skipping our headlines, and we're going straight to Russell. Hey, Russell, come on in. Hey, Amber, how are you? I'm doing fine. Summer is finally here, officially. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, uh, it, last weekend, it was hot here. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, up and down, up and down, but still, it's better than uh, 30 below, that's for sure. That All right, true. Russell, <laughs> I know we've got some new uh, watchers tonight, so where should they be watching the show? Oh, there are so many places to watch the show, but the best place is on YouTube at youtube.com slash Amber Live, because if you watch on YouTube, we are in full HD there. If you uh, want to watch on Facebook, you can. There's Twitch and Twitter, uh, but... YouTube is the best place to watch. Plus, all your friends are over on YouTube, and that's where you'll find them in the chat room there, and you can talk to them during the show and send in comments to Amber at the same time. I do want to remind people that we have a TikTok, an Instagram, the Facebook, and even our website, and they're all listed right there, and you can go find all kinds of great Amber Live material there. And if you're driving in your car and all you can do is listen to the audio, we now have the Amber Live interviews as well, which is a podcast of all our, well, not yet. Every week I'm releasing two interviews um, and it's building up quickly. So there's uh, already like 20 interviews out there, tons of things to listen to. So get out there, subscribe, like and listen to Amber Live. <laughs> oh, and we love it when you go on YouTube and you give us a thumbs up and you comment, make a comment or two. We love that. So please go ahead and do that on, on some of the old shows too. If you're bored, don't have anything to do, go on our channel and you'll find something to laugh at. That's for sure. Yes, definitely, definitely. So, And we want to make sure uh, that you uh, know where what's coming up on Wednesday nights is our Amber Chat. We get together around 8.15 on Wednesday, talk for an hour or so from people from all over the country, all over the continent, all over the world. And we talk about what we had for dinner, what we watched on TV. This past week, we talked what we were going to do over Memorial Day weekend. So we found out that it's great to see our friends from all over the world share things and they become friends on facebook and it's a nice caring community so i really like that it's a great group of people in the amber crew yes, uh, the amber <laughs> crew so and then i want to remind people that this is our last week for our pledge drive and we Ooh. need your help and lucy bell is here to tell you all about it hey lucy bell lemay here do you know that amber lemay and her producer russell have created over 100 hours of quality entertainment just for you. Interviews with famous actors, authors, artists, and entertainers. 100 hours. Now that means if Amber LeMay was a movie, you'd be sitting in that theater for over four days. That's a lot of soda pop and popcorn, folks. Well, now we need you to donate just a little to keep you in your seats, your eyes on the screen, and Amber LeMay in your home. So, take your phone out right now, 
right now I say hit that Venmo button, donate any amount, $10, $25, or whatever amount I can make you feel uncomfortable with. And for every donation of $25 or more, Amber LeMay will send you her personally autographed photo for you to display in any old room in your house that doesn't flush. If you donate $50, we will send you the signed photo and a magnet with our logo on it. And for a donation of $100 or more, we'll get you a cameo style video from Amber. Topic of your choice. Finally, for $500 or more, Amber will join you live on a Zoom. Venmo now, y'all, at RJD Pro, or use that support button on our website, amberlive.tv. Thank you, Lucy Bell. Yes, and I want to remind everybody, as you saw there, once again, our anonymous donor is giving up to $1,000. He's going to match your donation. So it's vital that you, if you can give, now is the time to do it. And we really need help reaching that goal. We want to get there. And I do so. want to say thank you uh, very much, Lucy Bell. And Lucy Bell had a birthday this past week. And then today, on Sunday, Lucy Bell and I were helping out with the Vermont City Marathon. We were back on the corner of Cherry and Church for, I think it was the 10th or 11th year. We were out there directing the runners here and there. We had a great time. So, uh, hi, Lucy Bell. Thank you for being my friend and cousin. Happy birthday, Lucy. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, tonight... We have some great guests, two amazing actors, and a, another power couple in our power couple series. Uh, and that's first one of them is Stephen Wallum, who was on Nurse Jackie for six or seven seasons and has acted all over the place, both on stage and screen. And then his other half, Tony, Tony Humrichauser, who is just as accomplished as Stephen and is an actor, director, choreographer, and even an artistic director. And the two of them have just done it all in the theater and film and television world. So it's going to be a great show. Yes, we interviewed them uh, last week. So it's a recorded interview, but it is so cool, fascinating, and just wait till you hear how they met. That's really a cool story as well. So that let's is. get on with it, Russell. All right. As Russell, I just told you, we have a great couple tonight to talk to, and that's Stephen Wallum and Tony Rickhauser. And uh, first, we're going to talk to Stephen Wallum. Stephen, come on in. Hi, Amber. Hello there, Stephen. Now, immediately when you came on the screen, I'm sure many of my viewers said, I know that guy. Well, they better. <laughs> if they have any taste, they better recognize <laughs> me from something for crying oh, out loud. Well, well let's, let's spark their memories by showing them your, the reel that you uh, sent us. Listen, I would really like to get started because we have a bit of ground to cover. Gloria Colitis' office. I see. I'm sorry, she's not in the office right now. Maybe I can reach her. Hey, Megan, see if you can reach Mrs. Ecolitis at Mayor Bloomberg's office. They're having their Tuesday lunch. Thanks, hon. Hello, Miss Chung. Oh. Oh, of course you can try her tomorrow. I'll let her know you called. Mmm, bye. Holla at your boy. <gasps> I just got notice that there's a mandatory drug test. I was only in the pharmacy for a minute. So they're gonna find out you're diabetic, right? Let's just say that I went out with a 23-year-old dancer slash mime last night. Okay. No, not okay. A mime? It's more of a woman chance type, but it doesn't matter. Let's just say that he hypothetically offered me a joint, and let's just say that I hypothetically got baked. Okay, I didn't even smoke in college, and now I could lose my job. And this is why I don't go out. Ta-da! <gasps> I could stand Julie up and hang out with you. That's right, and then we'll show her a thing or two about a thing or two. Really? You'll do this? You had me at keep the shampooers tip. I don't like her attitude. We've come so far. Oh, you want to hear a funny story about coming so far? Last night I was watching Modern Family. Mm -hmm. Phil Dunphy was shirtless. Yeah. Long story short, I ruined a wall sconce. <clears throat> From my read of things, this case covers a common law issue regarding Sylvia 
and her brothers uh, involving this bar. <laughs> You're a mess. Let's just get the facts clear first. Horace and Pete's this bar, uh, previously owned by Horace Wittell, deceased one year ago today. Really? Yeah, it's not a coincidence. Go ahead. Okay. It's quarter to three. There's no one in the place except you and me. So set him up, Joe. Jackie. I got a little story you ought to know. And I'm not going to sit through some bullshit musical if it's not going to get me any pussy later. We're drinking, my friend, to the end of a brief episode. Make it one for my baby and one more for the road. That's pretty impressive, Stephen. Okay, watching that, I felt like it was an in-memoriam sequence from the Emmys. <laughs> I haven't watched that in a long time. It felt that all that slow motion stuff, like, oh, he had a... I'm so sorry he passed. He had such a good career. <laughs> <laughs> so the main thing was uh, Nurse Jackie there. Uh, tell us about your experience working on Nurse Jackie. Oh, my gosh. Um, it was my first ever, uh, not for lack of trying, but my first uh, television job, first on-screen job after being a theater actor. Um, I was 40 when I got it, and I had been doing theater since I was eight. So it was a long, long time coming, and I could not have asked for uh, a, a better experience as my first time out because it was um, just across the board, lightning in a bottle with the uh, the writers and the cast, of course. I mean, I was working with the best of the best and um, amazing seven years, which these days, you know, if a show makes it past one season, it's kind of a miracle. So uh, I miss it so much. Um, and it's mostly because of, of the relationships I formed at the end of the day, you know, as, as you know, anybody that and all the people that most of the people you've talked to, I'm sure a lot of them anyway, uh, you know, this whole thing of being in in theater or in, in show business or in the arts in general, when you're constantly doing a new project one after another and you meet a whole bunch of people and some people and then you're gone. It's usually done, you know, especially with theater. That's a usually a pretty finite thing unless it's a long running show. Um, so the fact that this was seven years and I looked forward to every single day I was at work and I just pinched myself saying, this is, this is joy. This is, I, I never imagined myself being on a TV show. That's just not something that was in my, my ether, in my um, imagination. Um, so it's amazing things that can just happen when you least expect it. And, uh, amazing. And I got one of my very closest friends out of in my entire life, Edie Falco, has become one of my best friends out of that. And uh, so that's what matters to me at the end of the day is is the people. It's always about the people at the end of the day. I, I'm interested when you said that you didn't imagine yourself being on television. There, yeah. are, there are many theater snobs, for lack of a better word, who wouldn't even think about being in television. I know. You know that's it's not ridiculous. an art form. Yeah. Um, did you hear any of that? No, because I by time Jackie was, you know, our first season we were shooting in 2008. And by that point, um, especially with cable television and the fact that we were shooting it in New York, Ooh, that yes. entire cast and 99% of the guest stars were theater people. And me being a giant theater geek, you know, I would see the call sheet for who the guest star was that day. And it would be like, oh my God, they won the Tony in 1985 as best supporting actor in a blah, blah, blah. You know, that, and everyone else would look at me like, what? I mean, they had no idea. So it, so it, we were populated with theater people uh, backwards and forwards. Uh, Liz Flayhive, who has gone on to, she created Glow after Nurse Jackie and um, and Roar, which is on Apple TV right now. She was a playwright 
So she was the one writer that was with us all seven years. And she started out as a playwright coming into television writing uh, for the first time. So we had theater genes, every, theater blood and guts everywhere. So I, I don't know what it was like for anybody else, but for us, it was, it was perfect because um, there were so many people. And Edie started out in the theater. I mean, that's, that's her blood. You know, she didn't come into The Sopranos until later in life. Up until that point, she was all about theater. So um, luckily, it was it was embraced in our situation, and we never heard otherwise. So. Now, one of the things I really liked about that clip was your your appearance in Difficult People. <laughs> I I watched that show. I didn't remember you until I saw that clip. I go, oh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. That. I, that laugh, that show just made me laugh from the. And I, the that was drive. an audition. When I auditioned for that, I, and then I got it, I, because I knew how big it had to be. And I thought this is either going to be the most embarrassing thing I ever do because it's so big or it's going to be great. Now, the thing that clinched it for me is, is the twist at the end where this character ends up being bisexual and comes on to Andrea Martin, which you don't see coming at all because he's this big flaming thing. You know, that's what I love. So it wasn't like another cartoon for the sake of another cartoon. It had a great hilarious twist at the end. And uh, then once I saw it, I felt better, but it's the big, you know, huge. that's huge. This guy, Chad was just gigantic. <laughs> Not that we don't all know people like that. You know, that's, that's the truth, but um, that was a blast. Oh my gosh. And Andrea Martin has been a friend for a long time, but we've never worked together until that. So that in itself was um, just a blast. Absolute blast. Talk, talk about a theater icon right there. You know, oh it's, my God. Uh, what a career right? she's had. Yeah. yeah. From Second City and to Broadway to everything else she's done. I watched Second City TV more than I did SNL when I was a kid. Yeah. I was yeah. more drawn to that. So I... So, so between Andrea Martin and Catherine O'Hara, those were, those were like my, my comedy icons, you know, not necessarily SNL at all. So to then meet these people, you know, and you've had this experience, I'm sure, where you get to meet people that you have admired from afar to meet them, but also get to work with them. I, I'm just, that's, that's the stuff that makes it just pure joy for me. So currently you're on two shows. Um, yeah. Law and Order. Law and Order. They, I, I have done three hus, uh, TV hospitals now. For some reason, I don't know what it is about my coloring maybe with the, the pale blue of hospital walls. But yes, I am uh, recurring as another nurse on, um, but a different kind of nurse on Law and Order. I've been doing that for the last couple of years. Um, but this time it's what's, what's called a sane nurse, which I had not heard the, the term before. Um, and it's a sexual assault nurse examiner. So it's a much different type of nurse than I played on, on Nurse Jackie, which I love. Um, and then also on The Resident, another hospital show, uh, I am a social worker. I am a blind uh, social worker. And I was supposed to die. And I was that was supposed to be one one off. I was supposed to do one guest appearance as a patient. And uh, lo and behold, they decided to keep me on and give me a job at the hospital that almost killed me. Because <laughs> that's television, ladies and gentlemen. So tell us about that character being visually impaired. Uh, how did that go over? Um, I am visually impaired myself. And when they, okay. um, I lost sight in my, in my left eye, um, because I've been type one diabetic since I was 10 and complications started to, uh, really hit me when I was in my forties and, uh, long, long story, but the end of the day, I lost my sight in my, in my left eye. So when this character, uh, of Winston, was uh, they were looking for for an actor for this character. They specifically, uh, which is great, they said visually impaired in some way. Um, so I felt like, well, I, 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 I'm not completely blind and this character has been blind since birth, but um, I can identify, I obviously can identify. Um, so 
the added bonus to this when they ended up making me a recurring character on the show and getting a job in the hospital, it's this amazing representation that I never would have guessed that because here they, they've now made no reference of his blindness since my first appearance where it was obvious I was blind and the whole plot line had to do with that. But now I'm a member of the hospital staff Nobody mentions it, and I, I'm good at my job, and I just go about doing my job. And that kind of representation has been amazing. And I, the best thing that happened was I got a Twitter message from a blind social worker. He, his wife was watching the show. He watches it. I'm not sure in what, what form he watches it, uh, but uh, he wrote me the loveliest letter and said, I can't tell you how much this means to me. I'm a blind social worker. And for that to be represented on television, that's never happened in his particular field. So I'm incredibly proud that I can play this character because, again, there's no reference to him being blind. I, walk, I use a cane and it's obvious I'm blind, but it's never a plot point. I just go, I'm good. At, I do my job. And that's pretty cool. That's, I'm very proud of that. That's very cool. And it's great that you received some recognition from someone who was visually impaired. That yeah, that I couldn't have guessed. Yeah, then I know. It was like doing Nurse Jackie and hearing from when real nurses would come up to me and recognize me and say how much they love the show and you guys got it right. And that is the biggest compliment. That means more than any critics' opinions because when you've got somebody who's actually living that life come up to you and say, uh, we love it. I love it. You you represent what we do, and you're doing it respectfully, and we love it, and we love your character, and that's that's the biggest icing on the cake. So, what what's what's next? What are you working on um, right now, or will we see you in, in more episodes of The Residents? And I uh, hope so. Well, I hope so. The show was just picked up for another season. It was very dramatic because it literally ended up being out of all the net. All of the network shows, The Resident and 911, both on Fox, were the last two that had not announced if they were being picked up or not. So it was this, it was very dramatic. I don't know. Maybe it was, it was very, if it was planned, it was very smart because it got everybody talking. But the show just got picked up as in last a week ago. So uh, I hope, I hope, you know, uh, that they that they bring me back. That's another wonderful set. Matt Zuckery, who is the star, is the nicest human being you will ever meet in your life. And it is genuine. And it is an example of what a true star is. Because he's number one on the call sheet, as we say. You know, the call sheet, for people who don't know, is just the schedule for the day of who's called to shoot. And uh, he sets the tone, as did Edie on Nurse Jackie. That's The star sets the tone for an entire set. He's the nicest human being you will ever meet. So kind, considerate, brilliant actor. So I'm hoping they start back in the in the late summer. So I hope, I hope they bring me back. Yeah. And, and where is that filmed? Atlanta. And yeah, I'd never been. I'd never been. And Atlanta has become this hub now for for shooting film and TV. Like all the Marvel shows shoot shoot in Atlanta. Tyler Perry has his uh, studio there. He's constant, he's doing a million things. Uh, Walking Dead has been there for a while. It's become this, they're calling it like a little mini Burbank because it's become like Hollywood. Really? So yeah, so I fly back and forth uh, to shoot there because I'm not, I'm just recurring. So it's not every episode, uh, but uh, I would love it. You know, I, they can use me as much as they'd like. Anyone oh, I'm sure they will. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Anyone right, Fox, who might be watching. Thank you very much, Stephen. We're going to take a little break, and then we're going to talk to your husband. Great. And then we'll bring you back in together. So Great. thank you very Great. much. We'll be you right back. Thank you. Oh, wait, there's more. But right after, Amber Live Update. Now, a few weeks ago, we interviewed Neil Rafferty, a former Marine and the only openly gay member of the Alabama State Legislature. Well, Alabama's primary was Tuesday, and Neil defeated two other Democrats, so he will now be on the November ballot and will likely be reelected to his seat in November. Way to go, Neil! And that's this week's Amber Live update. And now let's get back to that interview. We just spoke to Stephen Wallum, so now we're going to talk to his husband, Tony Humbert Hauser. So, Tony, come on in. How are you? Hi, Tony. I got your name right, didn't I? Yeah, great job. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. 
All right. Very good. All right. We just talked to your uh, your very charming husband. And uh, it's interesting because um, you've got quite the theater background as well. Tell me about the, where you started theater and some of the things you've done. Well, when I was about 15, I did my first professional production in Detroit. And uh, 40 years later, I'm still doing theater. I'm very, very lucky. Um, what was that first show that you did, that first professional gig? I, I did uh, Baby John in a production of West Side Story. Yeah, who would have believed it? And I, you know, my family were not theater people at all. I kind of stumbled into it and uh, and always fantasized about being in musicals. Like, pro I think a lot of young gay men probably do. <laughs> and um, I was just lucky enough to uh, meet a director that really saw something in me, a man named Todd Swanborough, and he taught me how to dance and act, and I've been doing it ever since. I've been very lucky. So that was 15 years old, and you were in Detroit. Um, what was the next couple of steps that you had? Well, what happened was um, I went to, I started working in stock when I was 17, and uh, I came to Kalamazoo, Michigan to go to undergrad at Western Michigan. And uh, Kalamazoo is a beautiful little hot spot for the arts. There's a theater called the Kalamazoo Civic Theater here. Uh, it's 94 years old. So in addition to doing shows at the university, I was able to travel downtown to this beautiful old 500 seat jewel box theater and perform. And it was the place where my parents, I think for the first time in my life realized, oh, this may be something that uh, he could do. But I remember at that theater, sitting in the artistic director's office, looking around, uh, I was really curious about how things ran. And I remember looking around his office and I was saying, gosh, I would love a job like this someday. And that's the job I hold today. <laughs> at that theater. theater. Yeah, in that same theater, yeah. Oh my goodness! Oh, how that's a story. That, that's you. yeah. I went away into the world. I worked in Chicago for uh for about twelve years. Then I went to graduate school in Providence, Rhode Island, at the Trinity Rep Conservatory. Worked under Oscar Eustace, who was running the Trinity Rep at the time, and uh, and now Oscar runs the Public in New York City. Uh, so I was I was able to work with really great people along the way. But what I realized is uh, an important part of performing is not just uh, being indulgent, but uh, training the next generation. It's really important. So, and technique is really important to me. So I've always split my focus between performance, direction, and, and education. Uh, and I've been able to cobble a career together because of it. That's that's great. Oh, you, you said you were in stock. So that meant you traveled a lot. Um, what were some of the shows you did and any interesting well, stories? One of the first, uh, I've worked at the Wagon Wheel Theater in Warsaw, Indiana. Now, not many people know about it, but it's over 60 years old. And I'll just, I was just thinking, oh, my first year at Summerstock there, who was I working with? Oh, Katrina Lank played my wife in two productions, and she's playing the leading company right now on Broadway. Oh. So <laughs> she's nominated for the Tony. So over the years, I've been able to work at really great theaters that have been truly su supplying talent to Broadway and Chicago for decades. And so I've kind of been the everyman for all these theaters, been able to work with all these really wonderful people. But what I've sussed out of it was, it was the people that were really successful that, that I work with in stock and, and professionally were the ones that made it about the work. And so it's interesting that I'm incredibly proud like, of people like Katrina because, you know, she put the work in and that's why she's at where she's at. So we all start in those summer stock companies in Indiana and Ohio and Illinois and Iowa. And uh, I worked on a showboat for a few summers in Iowa on the banks of the Mississippi River. I thought I was Tom Sawyer for a summer, but it was really a great. Uh, it's, we have a really rich theater education in this country. And it's important that people take on the the charge of training the next generation and keeping that tradition alive. Especially today when there's no or very little arts education in the schools. You know, you're, it is. You're right. It's interesting. Junior high school, high school, they don't even want to do the classics anymore. They don't want to touch the classics. And then you get into college and, and you know, universities have become just 
basically factories for training the next generation. They're, 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 it's, there's a little bit of uh, factory mentality to training people versus craft and skill and art. You know, when I, I worked with an uh, uh, artistic director once and he said, what's your dream? And I said, I just want to work. And he goes, well, I can help you with that. I can help you work. If you want to be an artist, I can't, you know, he says so many people walk through the door and say, I want to be on Broadway. Fabulous goal. It is. But no place under the sun can get you that. You got to do the work. And when you do the work, it'll get you there. So um, I've been really lucky to have some really wonderful mentorship along the way. And I hope that I'm continuing that tradition. How exciting. Now, some of the, you, you continue to be an actor, an active actor. What are some of your memorable roles? Well, you know, um, uh, I took a little bit of a break. Steve moved, Steve and I moved to New York City. You know, I was a college professor. I ran a musical theater program at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. I ran a musical theater program at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri. I built them from the ground up. I was proud of the, the work that I was doing, but Steve ended up working in New York and we couldn't be apart. So I left and uh, I, because I had to make money, I, I became a middle school teacher, gladly, truly. And I taught middle school for 10 years doing amazing productions with these sixth, seventh and eighth graders. It was you know doing a full production of Wonderful Town in the West Village in New York City with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders and walking them through and saying, this is where they actually live. This is where Ruth and Eileen actually lived in this apartment on Gay Street and gave them a whole depression curriculum in the city, in the town, in the village that they're living in. Um, so it was real. I did a lot of things like that. But uh, occasionally people would call and say, hey, can we get you to perform? And uh, so I got a chance to play Tata and Ragtime I've, I got a chance to play Gordon Schwinn in A New Brain. I got a chance to play Malcolm in Full Monty. Uh, I got a chance to, I, I played uh, Leo Bloom in The Producers with Steve. That we'll was, talk about that. <laughs> yeah, it's a lifetime, uh, it's a lifetime uh, dream of mine. And, uh, and then uh, most recently I appeared in a production of Fun Home. And uh, yes, I was, we, we, we have, we, I believe we have a clip of that. Let's, let's roll that. Hey. Yeah. Where do you want to go? Oh, I don't know. I know a bar. It's kind of hidden away. CD club for folks like you know. Could be fun. Oh. 
Dad. Hey Al, did I tell you about that new project I've taken on? That old house on 150. Oh, you've seen it. It's been standing there empty. 40, 50 years at least. Than I thought. You coming in? Oh, so where did you do that uh, production? There's a small equity house here in Kalamazoo called the Farmer's Alley Theater. And uh, uh, the director is a, uh, is a woman named Kathy Muley, who, I, who directed me when I played Che and Evita about 20 years ago. And and she said, "How about you come back and play the father, and then uh, and then the woman that played my wife played Ava Perone when I did it twenty years before that. So I was really really lucky. And her daughter played my daughter in the play, which was really that's cool. such a challenging role. Uh, how many performances did you have to do? Oh, or did you get to do? It was about six weeks of shows. So yeah, so we were very lucky. It was a oh, draining." How draining that must have been emotionally every night. You know what was wonderful about? It? I have to say, it. Uh, um, uh, I, I was very close to my mother, but I was never really close. Uh, my dad and I had an understanding, you know, the silent relationship that most sons have with their dads. And uh, I learned about my own father, so much about my own father doing this role. Um, and uh, a, 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 I left the. The, sh the show 10 times more connected to my own parents than I did before I started the show. Because the, the decisions parents have to make and any and on a, on a hairpin, you can make the wrong choice. And they, you, you just try your best. You live your life. And, and Bruce Bechtel lived his life the best way he knew how. Right. I think they know we know everything. They know everything, but they're just making it up as they go. That's right. You know, and the thing is, you know, if any of us could go back and do it better, would we? We probably would. You know, so that's you know, I I, I had to find the good in Bruce Bechtel, and and I did, and I was I, you because there's two sides to every story, and you know, if you're playing Medea, you you got to find the good in Medea. Believe it or not, you can't play because negatives don't play. Right, you have to find the positive behind it. Um, and his positive was his only way that he could see out was out of this world. And that was his wow. positive. Well, Tony, thank you. That's fascinating. Fascinating. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to bring back your husband and we'll have some uh, interesting conversations. Wonderful. I'm thank sure. You. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but wait, there's more. We have cha a part, chapter. We have chapter three coming up in a few minutes. But first, let's bring Russell back in. Hey! <laughs> oh, weren't they uh, nice guys? I mean, just oh, nice guys. It's fascinating. We love talking theater, and you know, it was just a, a great experience all the way around. So, what else do we have coming up, Russell? Oh, we have a lot more tonight. We still have part three of the interview, or as you call it, chapter three tonight. <laughs> um, we have a, a message from Dwayne Scott Cerny. We've got uh, Rocco coming up, and we've got a Pass the Tea tonight. Pass the Tea is returning as a regular segment and not just about RuPaul. So you really don't want to miss that one. because uh, And I've got exciting. my rants and raves coming up. Oh, uh, and Amber's going to rant and rave. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get on with uh, with what you got. Yes, there, yes. Here's a reminder from Dwayne Scott Cerny. Hey, do you know what month it is? I'm not even sure what day it is, but it's the month of May, and May is fundraising month for Amber La May. So if you love Amber, and I know you do because you're watching the show, or you love Russell or Rocco Zamboni or Emoji Nightmare or Lucy Bell 
or that guy with three names, or Rusty peeing in a beer can, in the can, whatever that's about, then you need to donate, because it's time. We told you how to do it, just do it. We need you, let's keep this show going. It's fun, more fun coming, bye-bye. Thank you, Dwayne Scott Cherney. <laughs> And there's one other way that people can show their support, and that's by visiting one of our sponsors. Summertime, and it's time for vacation. Vacation. Hmm, where would I want to go? Uh, I know. I think I'd like to go to the beach. Uh, don't worry. I'm bringing my vodka with me. Oh, wow. If I'm going to the beach, you know what? I'm going to need some beach towels. Where can I get some quality beach towels? I know, amberlive.tv, there's a bunch of collection of really nice towels. And, oh, how about some t-shirts and some muscle shirts? Those would look nice on the beach. And let's see, uh, oh, if it gets cool at night at the clam bake, what am I going to wear? I better take along my Amber Live TV sweatshirt. Yes, that would be fun to wear. And then at night, oh, Oh, at night. Well, I don't have to order anything because I already have my Amber Live TV pillow. Oh, so soft. You're going to love it. And then the next morning, what are you going to need? You're going to need an Amber Live mug to drink your coffee or whatever you want to put in it. <laughs> and if you haven't gotten enough peen lately, check out our Rusty Peen collection. Everyone wants more peen. All this and more is available at Amber Live. TV. Order yours today. Yes. Thank you, Amber. But you know what? Now it's this Amber's turn for my rant and rave. Now, my rant this week is uh, sexual abuse among religious leaders. It ain't just the Catholics anymore. Pastor John Lowe told his New Life Catholic Church and World Outreach that he needed to make a confession because it was the biblical thing to do. Pastor Lowe received a standing ovation after telling his congregation that he was stepping down because he committed adultery with one person two decades ago. But before he could leave the pulpit, a woman, along with her husband, let everyone know that what Lowe did was not just adultery, but also a crime, because she was only 16 at the time he took her virginity. By the way, Pastor, the biblical thing to do would have been to pay the girl's father some money, marry the girl, and be allowed to never leave her. That's what the Bible says. And then there's this. The Southern Baptist Convention admitted this week that they had been covering up hundreds of accusations of sexual misconduct of their members. Members? Is that a good choice of words? Well, one of the most egregious cases was with Johnny Hunt, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention and longtime Georgia megachurch pastor. Hunt has been accused of raping a fellow pastor's wife 24 years younger than him. Johnny Hunt. Hmm. That would make a great porn name. And speaking of porn, here's my rave of the week. Norm Self was a minister and married for 28 years. One day during a campus outreach crusade, he met up with a group of gay men. It was soon after that con con conversation, he started thinking, hmm, that maybe he might be gay. And he quit the church and his marriage. And then at the age of 83, started making gay porn films. Self says, my personal mission is to make sure that sex negative norms are removed from our society's vocabulary and replaced with the implicit message that our birthright is to enjoy erotic joy and bliss. Hey, and getting paid for it is extra nice too. That last sentence was mine. What a different view than the other two that I was ranting about. And that's this week's rant and rave. And now back to the final chapter of our interview. All right, we've talked to Stephen, we've talked to Tony. Now let's talk to Stephen and Tony. Come on in, guys. Hi, Steve. Well, hi, Tony. <laughs> Good to see you. I How do have you been? I, 
<laughs> it's nice that you can see each other because I, I know Stephen's in Illinois and Tony, you're in Michigan. So That's I'm glad right. I could bring you together. <laughs> I've been, I'm, we're not fighting. I'm visiting family. That's why we're in separate places. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask how how does your relationship work, and if if it's this is how it works, that's fine. There you go. Right, one of us just leaves for a while, and then we do <laughs> interviews remotely. <laughs> uh, how, how did how did you two meet? Well, we do we we always pass this off when people ask. We uh, another thing that we share is that um, I I had been doing uh, Forever Plaid. Uh, the musical Forever Plaid uh, was basically my entire life for about 12 years. I was incredibly lucky. Um, I, I am glad, very proud to say I've done about 2,500 performances of the show in about nine different uh, companies. It was, uh, so it's, it's a, it's a, for so many reasons, it just is a part of my fabric, who I was, employment. Anyway, I was in the Chicago company at the time in 1997, and I was leaving. I was there temporarily, and I was leaving um, in the, the summer of 97. And Tony was just coming into the company. And uh, we were at the Royal George Theater in Chicago, which was basically cabaret space first. And our dressing rooms were there's just four four guys in the cast and we had the tiniest little dressing room where we were just slammed in there well my uh chair in the dressing room happened to be next to the door of the dressing room so this new guy was coming in at that point the show had been running for years and years we had new people coming in and out it's like oh here's another one right you know so it got to the point where, like just a revolving door well the door the knock on the door and i answer it because i'm next to the and here's this new guy who's coming in to introduce himself so i had the absolute pleasure of showing him around now, as you know, he's the nicest guy. You can tell. He's the nicest guy in the world. You know, talk about charming and lovely and wonderful and funny. So we had, I don't know, was it 20 minutes, maybe half an hour? I don't know. Um, and, and that was it. And then I left the show and I did not see. Now, we had a million uh, mutual friends. Um, so I always kind of kept track of what this guy was doing. But we weren't in touch at all. And this was... You know, the internet was still, there was no Facebook yet. There was no, nothing. 97, it was still, you know, there's only so many ways you can keep track. So then, well, you you take the next part, Tony. Well, <laughs> no, I, I, I end up teaching and, and uh, I used to teach professionalism. And my, my view on professionalism is not how much money you make. It's how you treat the work. Uh, that's what being a professional really is. And so I would always use Steve as an example. And, uh, and I said, I, I was going into a show. Here was this person who could care less that I was coming into the show. And yet he took the time to show me the theater and show me around. I go, I, I'll never forget that. That's the, So that to me is a sign of professionalism. It's how you treat the work. So I sent Steve a note. And this is in the early days of Facebook. I was brand new to Facebook. I was kind of late. So this was 12 years later. It was 12 years later. Yeah. And having been, you know, Facebook used to be for just academics, right? It was kids in the academia and then professors were in it and then everybody came in. So I was well-versed in Facebook. So Steve comes on and I said, you know, I just want to let you know that I teach a class and I use that example of you and I meeting as as uh, an example of professionalism and i want to thank you for that and then he responded oh that was very nice of you and then i responded oh well what are you doing and he goes well i'm leaving chicago i'm gonna move out to uh, uh to new york to follow my lifelong dream to be on broadway and uh in the then he we just started talking and in the meantime he auditions for Nurse Jackie, doesn't get Nurse Jackie. They create a part for him on Nurse Jackie. And we just start sharing information as our lives are going through. And then we're like one night going, is there something to this? I mean, we're talking like every day. Every day, yeah. And so- well, And you were, he was dating somebody else. He was in Kansas City. I was about to move to New York. There was truly no agenda, which made it even better because it took us, both by surprise, like all of a sudden we realized this is like, I'm looking forward to talking to this person every day. And the best part was he does a cabaret in New York City. He does this cabaret debut. I fly there 
I go into the cabaret space. I go to look for him. I go down a little teeny staircase to a very teeny dressing room, just like the one at the Royal George. I don't tell him. mama at, at the famous don't tell mama in New York. Yeah. I knock on the door. He opens it up just like we had met the before. And we've been together ever since, basically. Which didn't even dawn on me at the time, which is so funny. <laughs> Years later, we realized, oh, my gosh, we just recreated that. And I said to him, well, he was going to surprise me at first. He was going to surprise me and just show up to the show. Because my musical director, Becky Menzi, Tony has known Becky Menzi longer than I have. So, But we didn't tell anybody that there was this thing happening. Tony originally was going to surprise me, but then he spilled it. He said, I, I got to tell you, I don't want you to think it's weird that I'm suddenly in the audience and... And I wouldn't have, I would have been, I would have probably started to cry because how lovely that he wanted to surprise me. But then as we were talking and I said, look, if we, if we see each other in person and it's, there's not a thing there, we're already, we're such good friends now. It's okay. It's totally okay. But the second he opened the door, okay, I'm going to get choked up. Um, sorry. Wow. I didn't expect that. Um, you know, I knew it's like, oh, there you are. And we've been together ever since. So we use that as our anniversary, actually, is that night when he came to the cabaret. That that's what we consider our anniversary. Um, and we've been together ever since. So oh, what a lovely story. So what a two, lovely, two lovely plaids, story. Two plaids got together. <laughs> <laughs> so you have performed together on stage um, in the same production. Tell us about that. Well, I, I, uh, so, so here I am in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I have all these friends here that started this Farmer's Alley Theater. And out of the blue, they called and they said, hey, would you ever consider you and Steve doing the producers together? And, and I said, uh, no. They go, would you? And I said to Steve, would you like, to? and it was, you know, and I thought in my brain, I thought, I had been up for Leo Bloom t a decade before and didn't get the role. In New York. In New York. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to probably be Bialystok and Steve will be Bloom. And they said, no, no, no. We want you to be Bloom. And I hung up the phone and 10 years of <laughs> stopping that, not getting that part, I just started sobbing. And we came to here to Michigan and, and Bill Byrne, Bill Burns, who was um, is a Susan Stroman uh, disciple, is sanctioned to reproduce reproduce the show. So we did the original production, the original costumes, the original choreography in a very teeny theater that could not really hold all the scenery. So they didn't even know how big it was until we got, we all got there. Like, oh, oh where are we going to do this? Imagine all those walkers. <laughs> imagine the yep. noises off. A uh, noises off version of the producers, and that's exactly. <laughs> and I didn't see myself as like I never. Uh, Max was not on my radar at all. I never envisioned myself doing Max, and it wasn't until we were in the middle of it, and then like Tony said, working with with Bill, who to do all the original staging and choreography, um, was uh. It was such a, and to do it together, but it was such a blur. I mean, we still laugh. There was one point, well, you want to tell this? <laughs> I still feel bad about this story. Oh, no, I was I was just going to say we were just so lucky to be able to do the show at all. Because yeah. Now, oh, yeah. Kind of, I mean, that show is kind of one of those shows that, oh, I don't know when they're going to be, we're ever going to see that show on stage again, right? Right. We were lucky. But there was, there was one point where, because it was such, it, it's such a, for anyone who knows that show, it's such a, it's just nonstop. Once you get on the train, the train just goes and goes and goes. We never really had a break until we got to springtime for Hitler. And that was, <laughs> so we were like, oh, thank God, this is the one number that we're not in and we get to relax. Well, we're drenched with sweat. And at one point early in the run, uh, I think it was when uh, Max and Leo meet, it was Roger Debris' apartment, right? I think. Oh, where you I, looked at me and you just, just said, I just went up on my lines. I, I, don't, I looked at him and I said, I, I just was in the middle of a bit and I said, help me. And he goes, can't. <laughs> <laughs> just gave it up. Can't. Because I literally couldn't. I was, he still <laughs> nudges me. I'm like, can't. I was telling you the truth. I really did not know what was going on. Can't. 
Yeah. <laughs> so that's how supportive I am on stage. I would have helped if I could have. We were I did not know what was happening either. I was we very lucky to do that show. We were so very... I understand you're working on a project right now together. Tell me about that. We're doing a cabaret show at uh, uh, Michael Feinstein has opened a club in Indianapolis at the Hotel Carmichael. And uh, we were asked to go down and do a show together. So we're very, through Actors Theater of Indiana, they invited us as their guest. And we're doing a show called The Summer of 78. And it's all, it's the greatest hits of 1978. Oh. And, and we're excited about it because that was a great year. Wasn't that a great year for music? Oh, well, I was 22 at the time, and it was. I 70s had the best music ever. And, I, <laughs> and, and 78 has just such a beautiful, uh, I, I, it was when I kind of was coming into my own adolescence. And so that's when I started having all those adult feelings for the first time. So all those uh, all those songs from that year really have a deep meaning to me. So uh, I, we're really excited about working on it together. Uh, what, uh, I had it, no idea um, until I really. Let's see. Oops, sorry. The connection problem. Are we good? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Whoops. You said okay. you had no idea. Everyone, oh, everyone is freezing on my end. Is that my my connection? Oh. Anyway, I was uh, saying I didn't I didn't know until I started uh, researching it how many unbelievable songs. And what was good about that at that time, if you look at the top 10 or top 20, uh -oh. it could have the variety of artists, you know, from country to um, Completely to rock, to exactly. um, Motown, to Broadway. It was all right there. We all listened to those songs. Well, and, you know, that's you bring up a really great point. Uh, go, accelerate two years. You accelerate two years and. Into, we're, I'm doing Xanadu right now. We close tomorrow. Zan, that 1980 was a convergence of such amazing music. It was new wave and rock and roll and disco, and they all kind of come together. That's why Xanadu is such a hodgepodge of a movie because they couldn't decide where to land because music was in such flux. But you're right. You listen to the top 40 of that time. It's so refreshing. Get a little bit of everything. And, and it gave you a wide scope of music versus such a narrow uh, view of music. And it was a magical time. How is the cabaret um, composed? Or composed? Uh, what, uh, how, how, how are you putting it together? Well, you know, Steve's the king of Russia. cabaret. Steve, Steve has done so much cabaret. I usually throw, I, we, we share ideas and I throw ideas his way. And he'll say, well, what usually happens is, and he kind of schools me, uh, uh, at, at, because he's been doing it much longer than I have, right? So, uh, so that's basically how we work. How about you, Steve? What do you think? Yeah, and we're just we're we're still, uh, you know, Tony's just coming off of of Xanadu opening, so you know, I'm in awe of him able to. He's not only you know full time artistic director at this theater, but then he goes back at night and directs these shows, multiple shows during the season. So he's now that Xanadu is open, we're we're just sort of in the. Uh, beginning stages of finally uh, shaping this show. But um, we've got all sorts of ideas of sort of our, you know, dream ideas of how many pieces we want to use musician wise. And, you know, we're still sort of figuring all that out, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's fun. I love shaping uh, cabaret, you know, because nothing drives me crazier than people who just sort of say, and then here's another song that I like, and I'm going to do it for you. Now, it, you know, I can't take it. I can't take it. So between the two of us, you know, I think we're going to, we, we want there to be a shape to it other than just, here's a bunch of songs we like from 1978. I know that as we continue to shape it, it will have, I think it will have a little journey arc. to it. Yeah, a little arc to it. We both can't help but shape things that both as, because we're both writers and directors and actors and uh, artists. We both, we both are. We both draw. Yeah, we're both visual artists as well. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. And just to be back on stage again in this crazy time, you know, and, this and and the venue itself is breathtaking. It's just beautiful. It is beautiful. It, yeah. It, you know, the New York venue is, uh, you know, the 54 below space is incredibly wide, right? 
but it's a great idea, but it's a wide space. So what, what he's done between that and his, I think he has a space in LA as well. They figured out the configuration. So they've made, they, it's basically the same configuration, just reduced a little more intimate and it's gonna be a pleasure to play in. It feels like an old, like a supper club, like the old old time supper oh. clubs of the bygone era. Yeah, which we just don't have. I anymore. always love the the Lucy. I love Lucy shows where they were in the just supper. I was going to say yes, me <laughs> too, agree. me <laughs> too. My favorite, always. I, I do believe there is a place in this world for floor shows. I I do too. I think I think there would be something incredibly refreshing about spending a night and seeing a few variety acts and seeing a, a singer weave its way through. I just I think we're starting. Yeah, you don't need a multi million dollar set coming in behind you. Just I yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. So do you do you see that uh, this cabaret being played in New York or L A. or as it being a well production? you know. The, th the thing that would be very nice about it is once it's on its feet, we can then we can just take it somewhere, you know. So that's that's I, I would like that idea. I, I, I've not had a chance to do shows a show in New York. I've directed Stephen Edy, uh, Stephen Edy Falco, Edy's first cabaret called The Other Stephen Edy. I directed that. I directed Stephen in another vehicle as well, but I've never had a chance to really perform uh, in New York. So I was well, like Stephen Tony. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed meeting you and talking and listening to your stories. Uh, I love the theater stories and what you've done, and I can't wait to see uh, uh, hear more about your cabaret and uh, to hear more of your stories and what you're going to be doing. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you. you. It's been pleasure. such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony and Steve. I had a great time and. We're going to have to have you back again. All right. So we told you earlier, Emoji Nightmare is back with Pass the Tea. But this week, it's not about RuPaul's Drag Race. It's about something else that she's been up to. But tell me, who do you like most so far in RuPaul's Drag Race that's on? Huh? huh? The legends. Mm, my favorite so far is Jinx and Monet Exchange. But who's yours? Anyway, take it away, Emoji. Girl, that's hot. Hey, what's up? It is Emoji Nightmare, and I'm back for Pass the Tea. We're gonna do this uh, occasionally, kind of when I feel like it. Um, maybe once a month, maybe twice a month. Who knows? Uh, buckle up. You never know what you're gonna get with me. I released some new merch. This is Comsterella. She's gorgeous. She's dripping. Um, Nicole Christman, a Burlington, Vermont artist, um, helped me bring Comsterella to life. Um, of course, she is everything that emoji is, uh, except even sexier, if that is even possible. Yeah, so go to nightpain.com or emojinamer.com and check out my merch. Um, and yeah, it's very exciting. What I'm gonna do on Pass the Tea Now, we're gonna talk about whatever I feel like talking about, and today I wanna talk to you about this bitch. So Lovely Comsterella got me in a little bit of hot water recently because I do Drag Queen Story Hour all across Vermont. I have been up to the Canadian border in Richford and all the way down to just recently Weston and everywhere in between, you name it. Peachum, been there. North Hero, been there. Middlebury, been there. Rutland, been there. Point is, I love to read books to children with my friend Nikki Champagne and now Katniss Everqueer, who's taking Nikki's place as she goes off and does the amazing things she does in the political world. Well, the town of Chester in Windsor County decided that they wanted to do Drag Queen Story Hour. We booked it, they started promoting it, and the library trustees had a bunch of issues with it because they went to my website and found Comsterella merch and they thought, no, 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 children shouldn't be seeing this. I don't know what four-year-old is Googling Emoji Nightmare and finding my website and checking out my clothing, my merch, uh, but I guess I can't be a sexy adult and someone who reads to children at the same time. And throw in the queerness? Uh-uh, no way. So the board trustees shut it down. They said, this can't be happening. Um, you over, they, they told the librarians that they overstepped their, their boundaries and they shut down the event. Well, Weston, who I just mentioned, heard about this. There are a couple towns over. They said, hey, Emoji, come to our library. We'd love to have you. And so uh, this last Saturday, I checked out the Wilder Memorial Library in Weston. It was lovely. It's the cutest 
little nook of a library. I here's here's some video. Um, it's gorgeous. Katniss and I get to tour. It's literally uh, like a one room schoolhouse, but for a library and head to toe filled with amazing books and such inclusive titles. Um, you could even do a puzzle. Katniss did a couple puzzle pieces while she was there. Um, and then the downstairs is their children's area, which of course would not have fit the 47 people that showed up this weekend in Weston. That is a library record for Weston. They have never seen that many people show up. So luckily the weather was gorgeous, maybe a little too hot, we were sweating. Um, and we had it outside, it was lovely and gorgeous. The local reverend showed up, we had a diverse set of families. Uh, we had a child named Wilder at the Wilder Memorial Library who sported a fabulous skirt um, and it was just an amazing time had by all. And I'm really grateful for Jessica at the Wilder Memorial Library for having us. And we'll be back there in August too because they can't get enough of us. We're so great. <laughs> but back to Chester. So Chester's library said, mm -mm, can't happen, no way. And uh, they shut it down, which is really too bad. But a queer couple reached out to me on Facebook and said, hey, heard about the controversy in the Chester Telegraph, that's their local online, uh, which I'm gonna call it, their little news source, and said, I'd love to I'd love to make this still happen. I'll pay your booking fee, which is honestly not that much money. Um, <laughs> it should be more. I'll pay, I'll pay the cost of what it would take for you and Katniss to come, and I'll find a local business who would host you. And so she reached out to Darlene at the Pizza Stone in Chester, and Darlene said, absolutely, let's do it. So thanks to my new friend, Marnie and Chester and her partner, as well as Darlene at the Pizza Stone. And of course, Deirdre and Carrie at the Whiting Memorial Library in Chester for even starting this whole thing. Thanks to the support of all those community members in Chester, we are still going to be down there on June 4th, that's next weekend, reading. Um, and hey, if you're in Southern Vermont or anywhere along the Connecticut River Valley, we're gonna be in Brattleboro, June 3rd. We're gonna be at Chester, June 4th. And then the night of June 4th, we're gonna be up in Bradford performing. So, so many opportunities to kick off Pride Month. That's the tea in my neck of the woods. And uh, Amber, thanks so much. I'm gonna actually be filming some of the footage next weekend. So you're gonna get the follow up to this whole saga in a couple weeks. Until then, mwah, mwah, happy Pride Month. It's next weekend. Happy Pride. <laughs> I'm Emoji Nightmare. And this has the tea. Back to you, Amber. Wow. What a story. Thank you for sharing that with us, Emoji. And now, you know what time it is. Let's bring on Rocco. Oh, hey, everybody. Hey, Amber. How you doing? I'm out here on this beautiful Memorial Day weekend grilling hot dogs because that's what you do. But did you know Memorial Day isn't just for hot dogs and hamburgers and kielbasa and chicken and flank steak and all sorts of other crap that's good for you and makes you feel better? Well, it's also for the military. You know, those guys that put on uniforms, carry guns and go out there and say, I'm defending my country, and then they get killed. That sucks. And the best they can do for these people is say, hey, here's Memorial Day. We'll remember you as I eat a hot dog. They deserve more respect than that. But that's what we got right now. So that's what I'm doing. I'm cooking some hot dogs. Why am I out here by myself? Shit, that's hot. Why am I out here by myself? Because I couldn't go to a barbecue because I got a little bit of a cold. Not that Rona, that shit is bad. But it's all right, you know? Amber, what are you doing today? I know, you're, you're doing some marathon shit or something. You're always doing something weird where you gotta go out in public and people were like, oh, here's Amber again. What the hell's she doing? Good for you. So, as I ramble with my hot dogs on the grill, I just wanted to wish all the people out there, you know, a good weekend. Remember all those veterans out there who died for you or somebody. 
Something tells me a lot of them died so corporations can make more money, but we're not getting into politics, so shut up. All right. Anyway, this is Rocco. Um, I'm going to go eat some wieners. Like you, Amber, but different, all right? Bye. <laughs> oh, Rocco, can't wait to talk to you in person again. Well, that's this week's show. I hope you've had a nice, enjoyable, long weekend. Or maybe you're watching this Tuesday morning at work. Whatever. I'm glad you came along for the ride. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. I wonder what that Madison Cawthorn guy is going to do now that he lost his primary. <laughs> Who cares? As long as he goes away. Probably he'll get a nice cushy job on Fox News. They don't seem to hire too many men who like to wear women's clothing. Do you think Amber will offer him a job on this show? <laughs>